Matthew chapter 20. So, week after week, we just go along with uh, what comes next in the chapter, and we go slow. So, if you don't like the Bible, you came to the wrong church. One of the benefits of going so slowly through the entire Old Testament, now the entire New Testament we're going, uh, is that... uh, I don't just pick and choose what I want to preach about. It's what God has for us next. And today, it's one of those, it's a parable. And uh, no, Aaron, not two cows. You'll get it as we go on. Uh, <laughs> it's a parable that uh, you, you kind of wonder when you, when you see it, why is this in the Bible? In, in fact, Jesus says a lot of stuff. It's just not the New Testament, too. I mean, the Old Testament is packed with stuff that I would not have put in Scripture. Stuff that is uh, offensive, hard to deal with, is really uh, doesn't make common sense. And uh, like, like the Beatitudes, when, the, when, when God starts his broadside against the human pride and, and, uh, and self-orientation, he says, those who are spiritually broken, you know, starts off with saying we have to understand our position before the Lord is, is being blessed, blessed, fortunate, lucky is the person who understands they're spiritually broken. We would think that the religious superstar is a person who's blessed, fortunate, lucky. So today's sermon is called, When God's Blessing Doesn't Feel Like Enough. When God's Blessing doesn't feel like enough. Chapter 18 begins, no, you're in the right chapter, I'm just reviewing. Chapter 18 begins with the disciples asking, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Listen, the entire message of Jesus Christ, Jesus came to die on the cross. He was going to die to pay the penalty of every nasty thing we've ever said, done, uh, thought. He took responsibility for all of that and hammered it to the cross. That That we don't have to pay for our sins, he did it for us. His mission while he was here on earth was to teach us there's man's economy and God's economy. Man's economy, the flesh, the world, these are the things that if you don't know God, these are the things we value. These are our priorities. I want to be popular. I want to be important. I want to have a lot of money. I want all these things to to fall in place. And then God has his economy. God's what what God, what's God's currency? What does God think is important? What does God treasure? And big surprise. The two are not the same. In fact, Christ is just hammering away at at this human-oriented religion. And every religion on the planet looks the same. And when Christians leave this behind and start going with our gut, our faith starts to look like every other religion on the planet. We start to value the wrong things. So chapter 18 starts with the disciples asking, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And if you're sitting there thinking, I wouldn't ask Jesus that question, They, they didn't. I mean, they didn't sit there and say, I want to be the greatest one. You know what people do, religious people do? You should have saw me serving this week. Or, or uh, you wouldn't know how much money I gave in the offering plate. You know, uh, and even that's too obvious. I mean, there are subtle ways of making yourself great. And they wanted to know how they could build themselves up because it was all about them. And everything we've been studying after the apostles asked this question has been uh, Christ answering that in one way or another. Jesus taught about children. You want to be great? Become like one of these. Totally counterintuitive. Doesn't make sense from a human point of view. Uh, He talked about the value of one lost person. Go out, find the lost person, bring them in, celebrate. He warned against being the person, uh, being the reason that people reject God. You've probably heard it said before that the number one barrier to people accepting Christianity is Christians, right? You've heard that before? Uh, There's probably more truth there than we'd like to admit. Jesus warned, don't be the one that stands between somebody and them getting to know me. And in the context of the church and people bumping into each other to see who could be more important instead of being a servant to one another, Jesus said, look at these children. 
If you cause one of these children to miss me because you're so wrapped up in who's important, it would be better for you than a big grindstone, the kind that a donkey pushes around, were tied around your neck and somebody pushed you over into the water. And that's the kind of language Jesus used. And the people would have thought, what? That's pretty harsh. And Jesus said, yeah, and it would be better for you to be the guy pushed in the ocean with the millstone around your neck than be playing these religious games that cause people to not want anything to do with me, with Christianity. Jesus went after the pride of, of the sin of pride. He taught about church discipline, which was kind of bizarre. Right there in the middle of this passage about children, he's talking about children, how much God values children. He breaks out this passage on church discipline. He taught about prayer and forgiveness. He taught on divorce. He warned the rich young man that his wealth was in the way of knowing God. And, and we're reading that book, Not a Fan. Great line in there. Uh, does that really mean I have to give away all my money to be a Christian? No, but if you're the person who's really protesting that and trying to find a reason why it doesn't say what it says, he's probably saying it to you too. Uh, what is it in my heart, in my life, that's between me in living a fully committed life for Jesus Christ. Whatever that is, Christ is saying, get rid of it. Popularity, job, expectations for my future, plans I have. What is it that stands between me and uh, surrendering more to the Lord? And he made this surprising proclamation that other believers, listen to this, the rich young man left, and Jesus said that, remember about the eye of, easier for, for a, yeah, a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And, and we talked about blenders and how that fit in. And, and uh, but Jesus said, then with God, all things are possible. And then Peter, totally missing the point, says, well, we gave up everything to follow you, so what do we get? You know, that's how we do religion, right? I followed you, God, so what do I get? What do I get? And God, having mercy on him, says, he first talks about their role as disciples, then he talks about heaven. You get heaven. And then he says, and if you've given up uh, children and parents and a, and a wife and, and land and a house because of me, if you've given up these things, look around you. You receive many, many times more. And in a very real sense, and this is mind-blowing, when you become a Christian, other believers are the reward of your faith. And you are the reward of their faith. So be a blessing and don't be a curse, right? You are the reward of their faith. That's part of that. And it's one of the big things. God says, well, Peter says, what are we going to get? He says, you've given up so much, you're going to get so many more brothers and sisters. And you're going to get heaven. And we think, well, I don't know if that's enough. I was kind of looking for more in the stuff in the bank account. Of course, God didn't say that. Jesus didn't say that. Let's look at now at uh, Matthew chapter 20, 1 through 16. The greatest enemy you have this morning to understand this passage for, uh, is that you've probably heard it before. And it becomes less radical when you've heard it before. Oh, and the other thing is you're sitting, you, you took a shower, you're dressed up, you're sitting nice, and you're sitting in a church, and you listen. You, you already know what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit here and endure the next 40 minutes, and then I'm out of here and going to lunch, you know. Let, these are the words that Christ, God in flesh, spoke when he came down from heaven. They're not comfortable. What does he have for us? So Jesus is talking. So he just ended chapter 19 by saying, but many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. If you think you got it all together in this world, look at here now, chapter 20. For the kingdom of God is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day. It's about one day's labor, a coin that equaled one day of labor. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others just standing around in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon 
about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked him, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his supervisor, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who had been hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius, full day's labor. So they came, so when those who, so when those came who were fir hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble <laughs> against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I have not, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the ones who were, I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you so envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. You know, we often say that Jesus was horrible at, uh, he would not be a PR man. Uh, take up your cross and follow me. Die to yourself. I mean, he did not know how to, the, what you should put outside on your church, you know, bulletin. What is that called? Thank you. Uh, he didn't know that either. And, and so he says these things that are so con counterintuitive, so contradictory, so insulting. He also doesn't know how to run a ministry. He doesn't uh, from a human point of view. Remember last week, the rich young man comes to him and says, I want to follow you, and I'm doing everything. And Jesus could have Jesus told him in a way, you know, just give a certain percentage of your money to the poor, support my ministry, he would have felt great because he's using his money. He's, he's already filled up with his money. That's where he's trusting. Now he's using his money to do religious things. Jesus gets money. The poor get fed. And this young guy feels great about himself. It's a win-win-win, except for the fact that this guy still has this barrier between him and God. That's his money. So Jesus told him what he didn't want to hear, and he left, and Jesus' ministry was unfunded. And then here, you've got people who want to follow him, and Jesus says, the people who work hard all day, I'm going to give them the same as the people who come in at the last moment. Where is the incentive? And that is so insulting. When you, when you read stories like this, because I was a missionary in Japan for, for eight and a half years, to people who've never heard this before, you know what they always think? Wow, that's not fair. That's the way human beings look at this passage. It is not fair. These guys worked in the heat of the day, laboring out there underneath the sun and the sweat and the bugs, these guys, the last guys, just kind of hung out all day, didn't doing their own thing, whatever they want. In the evening, some guy comes by, says, I'll hop in the truck, I'll bring you out to the field. It's cool now. Day, there's probably a nice breeze coming, everything's easy, not too much work left, and they get paid the same. Why does Jesus tell these kind of stories? Why are these stories so insulting to us? so offensive, so difficult to deal with. This story may not have been uh, something that happened literally, a real event, but it does teach us something real about God. It's in the Bible for a reason. It teaches us something about real about heaven. It teaches us something real about humanity and the nature of reality itself. This parable, uh, as a little side note, is often interpreted, and it may have been a prophetic warning to the Jewish people. Uh, that would be a little out of context with what we're doing right here, but to the Jewish people, just because you guys were first, you guys had the prophets, uh, you have this history of miracles, doesn't mean that you're better than those who will follow. The first uh, will be last, and the last will be first. I think that's probably in there. Uh, this story also reminded me of the story of the prodigal son. Did anybody else get that vibe when you were reading that? The story of the prodigal son, remember, uh, this, this guy comes, his brother comes to his dad. This is kind of insulting. He said, Dad, looks like you're going to linger a little while, and I don't really want to wait for my inheritance. I've been waiting for you to kick off, and, man, you're just hanging on. So can I get my money now so I can go waste it on prostitutes? And the dad says, okay, 
and the dad gives him half of the half of he has a, his inheritance. And he takes off and he's he lives wild, and he has a lot of people around him till the money runs out, and then he finds himself working with pigs, which was not a cool thing for Jewish people to do, and he's sitting there thinking, man, the pigs are eating better than me. I'm gonna go back because my dad treats his slaves better than than I'm being treated. I'm gonna go back and offer myself as a servant, and so he's trudging back to the house full of shame. Dad sees him from down the country road, starts, you know, they probably wear a I don't know, skirt like thing. He helps it up, you know, and this old guy's chucking, running down the road, and, and he comes running to him, and he, and he gives him this big embrace, and he just welcomes him back. Big brother, they, well, they have a big party then. He puts a ring on him, new clothes, uh, probably made sure he got a bath. Uh, they, 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 sack, they slaughtered uh, animals so they could, a fatted calf, so they could have a big meal there. Uh, they had a big party to celebrate his return. Meanwhile, big brother saying, wait, 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 wait. I've been here working the whole time. I've been working hard, and I never even once asked you, could I have a calf for me and my friends to do a little celebration? And the dad says, oh, we're excited that he's back. We're celebrating that he's back. And that's another story that you read to uh, people who have never heard it before, and they're saying, well, that's, they kind of feel bad for the elder brother. That's not fair. He worked hard. He should get more. That's the... We think you work hard, you get more. You work hard, you get more. And what God is saying, and it starts off with the Sermon on the Mount now there, is you can never work hard enough. You are broken. You are messed up. You need to come in faith. The rich young man was trusting in himself. These workers were saying, well, look at us. Look at us. We ought to get more. And God says, I'm giving you what I agreed to give you. I'm going to give to everybody else just the same. When we're saying, look at me, why don't I have more? Uh, why isn't my life better? What? It's all about the focus is right here, and we're totally missing the point. Uh, the Christian life doesn't orbit ourselves. You know how this, you know, I, what was that, Megami, one in four or something? I, this can't be true, right? We heard this week that, one in four Americans doesn't know that the earth orbits the sun. And my dad quoted somebody as saying, nobody's ever gotten poor by uh, <laughs> underestimating the American people. But that doesn't seem, that seems like somebody with an agenda. I don't know where they got that poll. But anyways, uh, our, our spiritual lives don't orbit ourselves. If you are at the center of your universe, and it's all about me, and look what I did, and look at, I'm in front of everybody, and look at the things I do, and or uh, woe is me, I'm just miserable and I'm n I can't do anything wrong. See, both of it one, of it, one looks like humility, one looks like pride, but they're both the same thing. It's selfishness, right? Look at me, I'm so miserable, I'm so messed up. Get out of ourselves and start orbiting the Lord. These fellas were focused on themselves. Keep in mind, again, how odd these stories sound to us. How would they have sounded when Christ, Christ first told them? Imagine Christ's followers all around him. The disciples ask, what's going to be in it for us? How can we get more? How can we be important? We want stuff and we want image. We want stuff and we want to have the high position. And Jesus is saying, the first will be last. Then he tells another story and said, the first will be last and the last will be first. You've got to become like children. And he even warns them, and if you don't become like children, you're going to miss the kingdom of heaven altogether. And then right here, he gives this other parable, and he talks about those who are working hard. And the disciples are saying, yeah, we're the guys who answered the call right away. We worked all day. We're working. We're working hard. And what? The people who haven't been living for Jesus have just been out there partying, doing what they want. They come to Jesus, and they're just as much loved. They're just as much forgiven. Well, yeah, because we didn't deserve any of it in the first place. It's all generosity. And God's saying, are you jealous because I'm generous? Brothers and sisters, this is an assault on our pride. We need to humble ourselves before that cross. God is the one who calls the workers. The workers, we, are the ones who answer and then labor. Being busy in the kingdom work doesn't make God love you more. Remember Martha and Mary, two sisters? Being busy with kingdom work doesn't make God love you more. Here's the flip side of that. 
when I'm uh, ministering and I'm loving people or, or doing counseling or I'm uh, preparing a message or whatever, teaching, when I'm acting like an idiot and I've blown it with my wife and kids and I've got a horrible, nasty attitude, God loves me the same. Because my position with God is based on his goodness, not my goodness. When you've done the very worst thing you've ever done, listen, God's love for you is not less at that point. All God's love is undeserved. That's the point. That's grace. If we could earn God's love, there would be no cross. We can't earn blessing. I deserve hell. Anything I get, eternal life, oh, wonderful. Forgiveness, wonderful. Brothers and sisters, wonderful. A purpose and a mission in life, wonderful. Peace, joy, it's all bonus because I deserve hell. It changes our attitude when we change from a worldly economy to God's economy. What do I deserve? Well, I don't deserve this, this, and that. I deserve hell. The reward for following God early in life is not more treasure. The reward for following God is not, uh, early in life is not more treasure. I became a Christian when I was four years old. I remember the day. I was sharing my faith in grade school. Uh, junior high school, high school, I bring my Bible to to school, and uh, I've even got a high school friend with me. He can attest this. I bring to school. We talk about it in the lunchroom. I st my first sermon I preached when I was 16. I don't get more stuff. The reward for following God early in life is not more ease or comfort or stuff. It's the joy of being able to work on God's team. Wow, I get to be on God's team? Messed up me? self-centered, self-righteous, unholy, corrupt me. And if you're thinking, yeah, that's Dan and not yourself, just look in a Holy Spirit mirror. I can't convince you. <laughs> look in a Holy Spirit mirror. We can be so messed up and selfish and self-righteous, hard-headed. The joy is that I get to be on God's team. I don't deserve to be on that team. I don't deserve to be second string. I get to be part of winning. I get to be part of a team that wants to love people. I get to be part of a team that wants to bring forgiveness to broken hearts. I get to be part of a team that's trying to move people from eternal damnation to eternal paradise. What a joy. What an undeserved privilege. He calls me early, I heard the call, and I got to labor. I got to do the drudgery in the vineyard in the heat of the day. And I say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I don't find that rewarding, when God's blessings don't feel like they're enough, well, I'm in disagreement with God. Because God actually thinks, God actually thinks, you know, they asked Jesus, what are we going to get? And he said, look around, I've given you a lot of brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers. Look at the church, look at the, Jesus thinks that's worth celebrating, fellowship. And God actually thinks that being, I get to work in the vineyard, even when the toil is hard, the sun is beating down and I'm tired and I'm worn out, right? Doesn't life put us there sometimes? God thinks that that is better than standing around in a street corner having a life that doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's God. He says it. I either believe it or not. These guys are just standing around doing nothing. Their lives didn't matter. He says, I'm going to give you work. It's going to be hard, and it makes your life meaningful. It gives you purpose for your life. I get purpose and meaning. I get to serve. And God says, boy, that's a lot better. That's a reward. Heaven is God's home. Uh, God gives his, 
<laughs> he invites people to his house. It's his house. He can invite whoever he wants, right? Uh, he, he gives it as a reward for everyone who agreed to come and work with him. It's not a reward for the labor, but it's the result of answering the call. Come on, work with me. Work in the kingdom. You say, well, I'd rather kind of sit around leading life that doesn't matter. Where's Oprah? Sorry, Oprah. I was in the same room as Oprah once. Remember Sonny and Cher? I pinched Sonny's bum once. True story. You didn't know your pastor was, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> True story, yeah. Uh, heaven is God's home. He can invite anybody he wants, and we need to respond to that call. Uh, listen, if you haven't responded to that call, do it today. Talk to me after church. We're going to pray together, and we're just going to get it done. Uh, there's no reason to not answer that call. Choose you this day who you will follow. We study in Sunday school class today that your present behavior is the best indicator of how you're going to be tomorrow. So choose you this day. Make a choice now. Stand with God. Stand with God's people. And we can just get that out of our way. Then we can start growing in faith. And if you're watching this on television, the Internet, uh, get here, contact us, and we'll, we'll get that done. And we would love to, to get that done. So again, the disciples wanted to know who would be more important what they were going to get for following Jesus. And his answer is that everyone receives out of the generosity of God. No one earns more. We all receive out of the generosity of the vineyard owner. No one receives or earns more. Another thing that Christ is making clear is that heaven is God's home. He can invite whomever he likes. It's not our job to complain about who is worthy or try to keep some people out. I think sometimes churches do that. Like we're, we're going to we're going to stamp ourselves as a, a liberal church, and so we don't want those kind of people in our church. Or we're going to stamp ourselves as a politically conservative church, so we wrap barbed wire around the cross and like, unless you vote the way we want, you can't be a part of our church. Uh, we often try to exclude people. Oh, look at the way they dress. Look at the way they talk. We don't want them here. It's not my home. It's his home. He can invite whoever he wants, and if people are willing to come to the kingdom, they're my brother, they're my sister, and it's not my job to keep people out because they're different than me. Amen? Amen. 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 And we're going to work on that because we've got to keep working at it because even though I believe it up here, sometimes in our heart we go, oh, they're kind of different. What's going on over there? Let's love people close to Jesus. God calls the laborers, and the laborers answer. They're led into the vineyard to work and receive their reward. This is yet another example of God's spiritual economy being different than the worldly way we tend to think. When the disciples asked who could be important, Jesus said, become like children. When Peter asked, what are we going to get for following you? Jesus reminded them of heaven, and then he said, and you get the fellowship of the believers. And now today we see the guy who's Guys who suffered the most and worked the longest and expected to get more money. And the landowner says, I'm not being unfair to you. You are getting what I promised you. And I thought right away, Jesus said, Jesus promised in this life you will have trouble. And it's like, gee, thanks. Uh, you will get what you promised you, but this land is mine. If I want to be generous to those who suffered less, what are you complaining about? Everyone was paid the same. For us, our payment is being able to work for the kingdom, being forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, having a meaningful life, heaven later, fellowship with God's people now. All the laborers were paid the same, but some were happy and some were disconsent. Choose you this day, brothers and sisters. I can feel ill-used, not respected enough, not loved enough not getting enough of this or that. And I'll be miserable. Some workers were happy. Some workers were not, and they were being paid the same. we got to choose. Is God's blessing enough for me, or does he have to do things according to my plans? I worked longer. You give me more, landowner. Mr. Landowner, he says, mine, it's mine. Are you jealous because I'm generous? The difference 
The men who had worked hard, long hours for the kingdom, the vineyard, thought they deserved better. They felt ill-used. And even secular psychologists will tell you a person who feels ill-used is capable of almost any wickedness. Do I define my life as of somebody who's been blessed because I've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ? Or do I define my life as I labor underneath the sun in the heat of the day? If we charge God with being unfair and gloss over all his generosity with us, you turn your back in the sun, things get dark. Okay, now that's difficult spiritual, like, like here. This is gravity, right? Right? Okay. Now here's a spiritual law. You turn your back on God, things get dark. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Peace, joy, everything. If I charge God with being unfair and gloss over his generosity, it will result in an unhappy, joyless life without any peace. I need to turn back to the sun. And God tells us, God would tell me, Dan, friend, I have done you no wrong. I'm giving you exactly what I said I would when you went to work for me. Take what I give you, but why be jealous because I'm so generous with others? Let's not compare ourselves. The Holy Spirit works different all the time anyways. I can't compare with the way God blesses you or the way God blesses me. This message was very convicting. It's hard. Other guys got big churches. Their deacons are not as cool. <laughs> I can't compare with the way God we're working with those fellas. Dan, if I'm generous, what is it to you? I'm being generous to you, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you are, God, and thank you. When God's blessing doesn't feel like enough, when we judge our lives by the flesh with a fleshly standard saying, give me this, I need this, I demand this, what else is left for us? Where else can we go when we turn our back on the author of all blessing? We are denying, when we deny his generosity, when we say his, his grace is not enough, when the cross doesn't shake our souls, we miss out and our life becomes spiritually powerless. We miss out on God what God intends for us to have. I want to close with this passage from 1 Peter. God's word to a church enduring hard times. Listen to this. Praise. Praise be to God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, do I wake up in the morning praising God? Do I go through my life praising God. When I get here to church, am I ready and eager to praise God? Or do I already have an attitude building up about something that's going on here, the pastor or the, the worship team or the way Norman cooks the sausages? I've never heard anybody complain about that, but I'm, I was just trying to find another. I told Rachel today that church is over 10 years old now. 90% of the people that have left this church did it because they didn't like me. And i got to keep pastoring. You know, that's, the, that's just the life of it. So do I come to church saying, oh, great. Or do I come to church saying, oh, God, I get to be with you and with your people. And we're all broken, but we're all learning about forgiveness. And, 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 we're, and our love is weak, but it's getting stronger. And we're learning to forgive. And yeah, I'd rather be part of that. So praise be to God. I will rejoice. It's my choice. Today, God, I'm yours. Wake up and pray that. Today, God, I'm yours. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Jesus is saying, you better praise God because everything you got was bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we have hope. And that hope is based on his blood. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith, for you who through faith are shielded by God's power into the coming of the salvation that has already been revealed in the last time. In all of this, you greatly rejoice. Talking to a church that's going through persecution. Hard times. We've asked before, you know the Christians that were alive 170 years ago? All of them are dead. 
many of them prayed, God, please spare me. And then they got to heaven, they thought, what was I thinking? <laughs> you know? In all of this, you greatly, in all the stuff the world brings on you, in all of it, you greatly rejoice. Though for now, for a little while, you may have to suffer grief of all kinds and all kinds of trials. Just a, it's gone. Our life is gone. And then eternity with Jesus. Right now, he's saying, you have to tr struggle. All sorts of trials. Grief is going to hit. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, faith that endures trials, is of greater worth than gold, it says, in God's eyes. God sees us go through the hard times. God sees us says, through the pain, yet will I worship the Lord. I will honor God. These have come. So the proven, these trials have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, gold which perishes even though refined by fire, that may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, this is faith without seeing, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving, you are receiving right now, even in the midst of persecution, you are receiving, you have inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the end result of your faith, which is good health, a lot more money, and a nicer car. Okay, thank you for today. Oh, no, no. Sorry. That was the modern translation. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy in the middle of trials and persecution. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. Your soul is saved. Rejoice, brothers and sisters. When God's blessing doesn't feel like enough, it's because we bought into a worldly way of thinking. Let's give it to Jesus. Let's pray right now. Dear Lord, here we are. We're weak, but we love you. Help us to just buy into your world, Lord. We want to labor in your kingdom. We want to have lives that count. Lord, please save me from myself. And Father, help us to be your instruments. Let's drive that pickup truck and ask more people to hop in and, and join the laborers in the vineyard. Let's go everywhere, Lord, just inviting more people into the kingdom. And Lord, together with my brothers and sisters here at Foundation Bible Church, we want to say, Lord, here we are. We're willing to serve in the heat of the day. Here we are, Lord God. Please use us for your kingdom. Please use us for your glory, God. And we know that you're never going to cheat us, but it will give us exactly all the blessings you promised us. Thank you, God, for hearing this prayer. Thank you for loving us in our weakness. Thank you for not giving up on us. Dear Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching Foundation TV. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.